uh, if under sevens want to go to the bar. Okay? This morning it seems fitting then to have a break from our walk through the Gospel of Matthew. Uh, so I just want to preach from the book of Daniel. Uh, and so if you would uh, keep your fingers in Daniel chapter 1. Uh, my theme this morning is, is simply life in exile. Uh, if we could have the projector please, uh, Jim. Life in exile. Simply because this is uh, a big theme in the book of Daniel, uh, especially in the opening pages. Uh, the dictionary uh, defines the word exile as the state of being barred from one's native country, typically for political or punitive reasons. Uh, simply put, if someone is exiled, they are living in a foreign country because they cannot live in their own country. Uh, usually, in, in our day and age, it's political reasons, uh, but there's always a number of reasons. And so my theme then is, is life in exile. Uh, because in a way, especially in our age today, as believers, it somehow feels that way, doesn't it? More and more, we feel like we, as Christians, are in exile. Mm -hmm. And in a way, that shouldn't really surprise us because the Bible tells us so. Um, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Am I on? Am I on? Am I on? Am I on? Next slide, please, young man. This is not, I think I have to turn it on. Ah. I have the power. <laughs> Wrong way, I think. Yay! Okay. Um, now I've just smacked it. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners in exile. John 17, verse 14. I have given them your word, and the word has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I'm not of the world. <laughs> Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Our, but our citizenship is in heaven. So you know that there was a time in our country when, when our culture was more committed to biblical values or to biblical truths. You know, I, I, I remember Sundays being one of the most boringest day as a kid. Because everything was shut. Everything was closed. You couldn't go anywhere. You couldn't do anything. Because it was the Lord's day. You know, you know do you wonder why in, there's, there's churches in almost every street corner? Um, and I know a lot of them are closing down now. But they used to build churches in almost every corner. Because they wanted people to be able to walk to the nearest church. So no one had an excuse uh, not to be in church on a Sunday. And those times are gone. And so in some ways, we feel more and more like we're in exile. And the land we're in, it opposes the God we worship. Our culture says, your God has no place in our culture in our time and your word has no place among us while we may not be in exile as daniel was there is a prevailing notion that we must conform to the demand to the dominant of this culture there's a pressure to to abandon our faith and adopt the values and ideologies of this world. Yet, 
Yet we are called to be in the world, but not of the world. As citizens of heaven, we are, we are reminded to, to set our minds on things above, not on earthly things, not on earthly desires or earthly pursuits that surround us. We are urged not to love the world or its ways, for they are transient and they are passing, they are flittering away. Instead, we are called to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, knowing that our eternal citizenship lies in the heavenly realms. Now, when we read the book of Daniel, we discover that God has a big plan for everything. In his word, he gives us a sneak peek of what will happen in the future. The book of Daniel is, is special because it contains prophecies, which means God predicts, if you will, he, he knows what the empires, what the nations, all the crucial events and the small events that would take place in history. The Bible does know the future. Skeptics doubt the book of Daniel simply because its prophecies are so accurate that they say it must be written after the event. Because you see, some of the prophecies have already taken place. And the skeptics say, you know what, no way, Daniel was, was written uh, before these events because they're so precise. They say no one can predict the future that's so precise. But we know who can. And he's the one who has inspired his book. And so some of the things God foretold in the book of Daniel have already happened. Showing us that his word is trustworthy. Now, there are still prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled which makes it an exciting book to read and to study. Now, it's important for us to understand that the Bible can't talk about things that haven't happened yet. It's like God telling us what's going to come in advance. And then this helps us to, to see that God has a plan for everything and that God is in control even if we don't fully understand it. As we read the book of Daniel, we can see how God is in control of everything and how he is involved in our lives. The book of Daniel reminds us to trust in him, even when life seems uncertain. Again, when we study um, when we study book of the Bible, any book of the Bible, uh, we must again remember that we are entering into a larger story, a story that spans from the beginning of time and continues beyond the events described in that particular book, in that particular account. And so the same goes for the book of Daniel. In the first chapter of Daniel, we encounter a man named Daniel and a powerful king called Nebuchadnezzar, who ruled over Babylon. Uh, so again, we must just recognize that God's plan extends far beyond these individuals and their time, which we will look at in a moment. Just like when we watch a movie in the middle of a series, uh, we need to be aware that there are events that have happened before and events that will happen later or after. And so the story of Daniel is, is part of a much bigger narrative orchestrated by God himself. And so as we approach the book of Daniel, we should ask ourselves, what is God doing in this particular story, in this particular account? What is God doing? What is his purpose? What is his plan? How does Daniel fit into the grand scheme of things? 
And as we dive into the book, we will discover God's faithfulness. We will discover his wisdom and his sovereignty over all circumstances. We will witness his power at work in the lives of his people and in the affairs of the nations. And so the book of Daniel opens with uh, Daniel chapter 1, verse 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Now, just a quick background here before we continue. From the life of Joseph, you remember Joseph, thanks in providential way, we uh, had that story this morning. Uh, from the life of Joseph to the time of Daniel, Joseph brought the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob also known as Israel, to the land of Egypt. They stayed in Egypt for about 400 years, and they grew and they multiplied from around 120 people to a nation of several million. After their time in Egypt, God raised up Moses to lead the Israelites out of slavery and towards the promised land of Canaan, uh, it took them 40 years of wandering in the wilderness before they finally uh, entered the promised land. Uh, once in the promised land, they lived without human king for about 400 years, during a period known as the Judges. After that, God allowed human kings to rule over Israel, starting with Saul, followed by David, and then Solomon. Under these kings, the tribes of Israel were united. However, after Solomon's reign, a civil war occurred, and the 12 tribes of Israel divided into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom, called Israel, consisted of 10 tribes, while the southern kingdom, called Judah, consisted of two tribes. And the northern kingdom of Israel lasted for around about 209 uh, years, scholars believe, until it was conquered by the Assyrians. The southern kingdom of Judah endured for 325 years until Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, invaded them uh, multiple times. Eventually, Nebuchadnezzar completely conquered Jerusalem, destroyed the city, and exiled many of the people to Babylon including Daniel and his three friends. So, who is this Nebuchadnezzar? Well, he was the mighty ruler of the Babylon Empire. And what's, what's interesting here is that, that his name, Nebuchadnezzar, his very name speaks about him being dedicated to the Babylonian gods. Nebuchadnezzar is a Hebrew translation for, uh, of a Babylonian name that honors a Babylonian god called Nabu. And so the Babylonians, uh, the Babylonians had lots of gods, and one of them was named Nabu. And it means Nabu protects the crown. Nabu protects the crown. And so in a way, it's like Nebuchadnezzar saying, I have a crown, my royal throne, because of the Babylonian god Nabu. And so in verse, uh, in, in verse 1 we read, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Now, scholars believe this happened around 605 BC. And in verse 2 of uh, Daniel chapter 1, verse 2, and the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Now, Nebuchadnezzar conquers Jerusalem and he doesn't fully finish the job, if you will. He, he does, however, set up uh, a puppet king, Zedekiah, as a king. Uh, we see this today, don't we, where nations, i.e. America, go into a certain country and they dethrone whoever is in power and they bring in a yes man. 
And this is exactly what Nebuchadnezzar did. And so Nebuchadnezzar, he established his power, his dominance over Judah. And so the question we have to ask here is, how was he able to do this? It wasn't because Nebuchadnezzar was more powerful. Yes, he was. He was powerful. Um, he was a mighty man of war. But this is not why he was able to conquer Judah. It was simply because God wanted to bring his judgment against Judah. Look at the phrase in verse 2. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand of the Lord. Or, or, or the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. Yes, we know the Babylonian Empire is mighty empire. This great king and armies numbering into hundreds and hundreds of thousands. And yes, we know that the kingdom of Judah is very small, very tiny, little kingdom. It doesn't have many soldiers. And it's nothing compared to the uh, geopolitical empire. But however, let me say this. If God defended Judah against the Babylonians, it would have never fallen. God can take the smallest little thing and defend it against the mightiest thing and hold it together. But God promised his people that if they were to forsake him, he would give them over to his enemies. That was part of the terms and conditions of the old covenant that Israel made with God. And this is what God, uh, this is why God allowed Jerusalem and Judah to be conquered by the Babylonians. <coughs> so, why did he allow it to happen? Why did the Lord give Judah over to the Babylonians? Well, two reasons. The Babylonians conquered Israel because the Israelites kept worshipping idols and disobeying God. They kept worshipping idols and disobeying God. God had warned them about the consequences of their actions through his prophets. The Babylonian captivity served as a way for God to discipline and purify his people because Israel was in idolatry and most of the time in in um, in their idolatry they wanted to keep Yahweh and still worship the false gods but Yahweh said no you will not have any other gods beside me and so the worship of idols like Baal and Asherah was a major temptation for the children of Israel. Baal, a B -A -A -L, uh, the god of weather, was attractive to them because uh, people believed he could bring rain and prosperity to their agricultural society. They thought by worshipping Baal, they would have successful crops and financial abundance when harvest comes. And the god Asherah, the goddess of fertility, was also appealing to them because people believed that that worshipping her would ensure fertility in the, in the fields and, and the livestock. It's interesting because worshipping Asherah involved engaging in immoral sexual practices including cultic prostitutes and orgies. And so the, the attraction to Baal was primarily driven by the desire for financial success. And while the temptation to worship Asherah revolved around sexual gratification, we see how these forms of uh, idolatry focus on sex and money. And I wish I could say to you how that ended with Israel. But far from it. We see it today, all around us, Baal and Asherah are still being 
worshipped by the people of this world today. And so to put it simply, God allowed Judah to be captured because of their disobedience to God. And we get that from 2 Kings 24 verse 20. It was because of the Lord's anger that all this happened to Jerusalem and Judah. And in the end, he thrust them from his presence. And when Nebuchadnezzar captured Judah, in verse 2 we read, along with some of the articles from the temple of God, these he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put them uh, and put in the treasure house of his God. Now, this is interesting. When Nebuchadnezzar invaded the temple of God, he took some sacred articles, some vital things from the temple of the living God, and brought them to Babylon, placing them in his own temple. This art was, in a way, a powerful statement that the gods of Babylon were stronger than the God of Israel. It appears as, as if Israel's God was weak and has been defeated. And so Nebuchadnezzar takes, takes from the temple of the living God and places those artificials, those articles, and he places those things into the temple of his false God with a small g. Again, it looks like the God of Israel has lost the fight. But far from it. However, regardless of what people may think, the true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is not weak or a loser. He reigns in heaven and has the power to prove doubters wrong every time. And that's why exactly, that's exactly what we see in the book of Daniel. That's what God exactly does through this book. Now, Nebuchadnezzar did not only take the treasures of the temple, you could also say this, he took the treasures of the kingdom because he took the best and the brightest of a young generation. Look at verse 3 and 4. Then the king ordered Ashdenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into uh, the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to save the king's palace. He was to teach them the language, literature of the Babylonians. And so notice here, he said, bring some of the children of Israel. Nebuchadnezzar not only took the treasures from the temple, he took the best and the brightest of the next generation that would be raised up there in Jerusalem and in Judah. And he selected the very best young men from scholars believe from the age of 13 to 20 years old. And he said, you are going away from your homes in Jerusalem and you're going to come and live in Babylon and you're going to work for me. This was exile. Moving from where you grew up, your homeland, and where you lived and traveling hundreds of miles away to come to a strange culture with strange language, strange customs, strange religion and now this is your new home you know today we we see people from all over the world especially the middle east north africa coming to europe because they seek a better life but that's their choice they come and they risk and that's their choice but for Daniel and his friends, it was not a choice. It's do or die. 
So let's try to understand the immense trauma here that Daniel and his companions must have experienced. Because I think we over underestimate this. The temple that had saved their people for 350 years was gone. The community that cherished God's word and worshipped Yahweh had vanished. The culture that to some extent acknowledged God was no more. The Hebrew schools and the knowledge and wisdom they imparted were lost. The institutions that God had, had used to guide, support, and bless his people were now non-existent. And most of all, the, the families, the generations who had loved God and cared for them were separated and left behind in Jerusalem. As exiles, they were detached from everything they held dear. But now the best and the brightest were forced to save in, in, uh, to, they were forced to save the pagan king of Babylon. And again, in a way, this is a smart move from Nebuchadnezzar. You know, you get the best and the brightest all over from the Middle East to come to your thinking. And the other reason that's probably a smart move is so that if anyone back in Jerusalem wants to start up a rebellion, these people you have captured can be used as a bargain tool. If you guys over there misbehave, we're going to chop off their heads. And so smart move. But on the part of Daniel and his friends, this is devastating. Mm -hmm. And the question is, how, how do you react to exile? Because the exile can make you feel despair. You look around and all hope is gone. Because what you see is the enemy enjoying their victory. Your God is in their temple, so to speak. All hope is gone. All hope seems lost. You know, today we, we might think the same. No one cares about the God of the Bible anymore. No one cares about going to church. No one cares about doing things right. Everyone is sleeping around and, and getting involved in this and that. We might as well join them. No one cares about righteousness. No one cares about standards, about faithfulness. And so Daniel and his friends could have been tempted to that kind of despair. Also, exile could make someone bitter or hateful. I hate the Babylonians. And maybe even I hate God for not protecting us. I wonder how many people this morning are here today and they hate God because maybe things did not turn out how they thought things would turn out while they're in exile. <clears throat> how many people this morning are doubting God simply because things are not panning out the way they thought things should be? Exile could also make someone forget about everything. They might say, oh, all I care about is, is, is the here and now. What I'm going to do now is survive. I'm going to cope by eliminating every memory of Jerusalem out of my mind. I'm going to eliminate the temple of God out of my mind and the word of God and the service of God. And all I'm going to do is just think about <coughs> Babylon. Exile could make somebody feel that way. It could cause them to give up and cause them to forget who they are. I remember watching a documentary about inmates. And these prisoners were being interviewed. Uh, these men had, had been sentenced to, to, to life in prison. One of them was asked, what's the key to surviving inside 
and he said, those who survive inside here are those who stop dreaming about getting out. I thought that's interesting. Those who survive in prison are those who stop dreaming about getting out. Exile can make you like that. You forget who you are and you forget where you've come from. What's the use if our God's not winning? What's, what's the point if God is not helping us? Why am I even in this fight? Why am I doing things right and things are going wrong in my life? Why should I be praying when things are not turning out the way things should be? Why should I bother reading my Bible if God is not answering my needs? Exile can make you like that. Just give up our distinctiveness from the Word of God and the people of God. Let's just all be Babylonians now. But Daniel and his friends did not give up. Daniel was a man who did not compromise. He didn't despair. He didn't become bitter. He didn't become hateful. He didn't forget his God. He didn't give up. He didn't give in. And so what happened next then? Well, we'll read from verse 5 to 7. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years. And after, they were to, after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azraf. The chief officials gave them new names to Daniel, the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azra and Badego. Forgive me for my pronunciations there. Now, notice two things here that are going on. First of all, we read in verse 5 that the king appointed for them a daily provision of the delicacies. Basically, these guys got a meal ticket to eat in the king's kitchen. And that's something special. But we know they refused that. And we'll look at that God reading another time. If you get to eat what the highest person in the land is eating, you are eating pretty good. Especially in the ancient world where there was a huge difference. The divide was huge between the poor and the rich. And the food that the royalty ate was something else. So that's the first thing that we notice. They get, they get, the, they get to eat the king's food. But they notice the second thing. And this is what I want to just focus on as we close. They get new names. They get new names. And so verse 7, the chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, um, Mashael, Mishak. And so forth. And so what's interesting here is that each one of these guys, each of these names for these guys had a meaning to it. There was a meaning to their names. Mm -hmm. Their names were connected with the God of Israel. Mm -hmm. But in exile, you can't have that name. You can't have that name that's connected with the God of Israel. Now that you're in exile, in Babylon, we're going to give you new names. We're going to give you a new identity. We're going to tell you who you are. You know, you came here from Jerusalem thinking you know who you are, but let us tell you who you are going to be. We are going to give you new names. So look at the new names they gave. They went from the name Daniel, which meant, uh, I, I hear at the end, Daniel, which means God is my judge. And they called him 
Belchesia, meaning Bel's prince. Prince Bel was another Babylonian god. And so what are you going to be? Are you going to be the god of Israel is my judge? Or are you going to be the prince of some Babylonian god? Then you have uh, Hananiah. Hananiah is the name, uh, the name means beloved by Yahweh. Beloved by Yahweh. Beloved by the Lord. He was changed to Shadrach, which means illuminated by the sun god. Illuminated by the sun god. And you also have Mashiel. Uh, it's meant to mean who is as God. And it was changed to Meshach, meaning who's like Venus. Who's like Venus. Uh, thank you, pardon me. Who's like Venus. Or Venus. And that was the Babylonian name for the Shura, the goddess of eternity. And then they had Asherah, meaning the Lord is my help. And his name was changed to Ambedego, meaning the servant of Nego. And so the question, as I close, what are you going to be? Are you going to identify with the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Or are you going to let the system of the exile press its identity upon you and tell you who you are and tell you how you should be? This was the great challenge for Daniel and his friends. Mm -hmm. And this is our challenge today. In verse 5, it's quite interesting. It says they were to be trained for three years in the ways of the Babylonians. In a way, if the Lord tallies, we have our whole life in exile. Mm -hmm. And who you will be, who will you be? The one who belongs to the Lord or the one who belongs to the world. Yeah. Nebuchadnezzar wanted to communicate a simple message to these guys, to these young men. And the message was simply, look to me for everything. Look to me. Because I conquered your God. Look to me. But they refused to bow to him yeah. and his system. Yeah. They refused. Yeah. And God came through for them because they looked to God instead. And so, beloved, don't be a disciple of Babylon. Don't be a disciple of this world. Be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Yes, things around us, it looks all hope is gone. But God is in control. He sits on his throne. And I hope to come back to this to show how Daniel and his friends stood their ground. Let us pray this morning. Father, thank you that you are indeed sovereign. I thank you that you reign on earth and in heaven. I pray that you would help us as we navigate life in exile, that our eyes would be on you and know what's in the world. Help us to give you honor and glory in all that we do. Amen.